Maybe it's only me, but yesterday morning, I confess, I woke up feeling shocked, sad, and even a little bit angry. It was such unexpected news. <laughs> Toblerone had reshaped and reconfigured their chocolate bars. Well, life can be difficult. But with the continuing story of war, refugees and economic uncertainty, for many around the globe and in this city, it's not an unreasonable question whether there is any real hope to be had in the world. The Irish blogger Eamon Fitzgerald has drawn attention to a famous painting by Paul Klee, produced in 1920. The painting is undoubtedly a response to the catastrophe of First World War, but it is now indelibly associated with its first owner, the Jewish art critic and philosopher Walter Benjamin. His description of the painting is now famous. A clay painting named Angelus Novus shows an angel looking as though he is about to move away from something he is fixedly contemplating. His eyes are staring, his mouth is open, his wings are spread. This is how one pictures the angel of history. His face is turned toward the past. Where we perceive a chain of events, he sees one single catastrophe, which keeps piling wreckage upon wreckage and hurls it in front of his feet. The angel would like to stay, awaken the dead and make whole what has been smashed but a storm is blowing from paradise. It has got caught in his wings with such violence that the angel can no longer close them. The storm irresistibly propels him into the future to which his back is turned, while the pile of debris before him grows skyward. This storm is what we call progress. Having lived through the First World War and now fleeing from the Nazis, Benjamin had lost all faith in evolutionary improvement. There is no arc of history toward justice. The myth of progress obscures the history of the oppressed, the poor and the marginalised. Is there a third way between Benjamin's unmitigated despair and profligate idealism? In Theology of Hope, German theologian Jürgen Moltmann famously distinguishes between hope and optimism. Both have to do with positive expectation and yet the two are very different. Optimism has to do with good things in the future that are latent in the past and the present. The future associated with optimism is an unfolding of what is already there. We survey the past and the present and then extrapolate about what is likely to happen in the future. And if the prospects are good, become optimistic. Hope, on the other hand, has to do with good things in the future that come to us from outside, from God. The future associated with hope is a gift of something new. Belfast has increasing reason to be optimistic. Interface violence has considerably dissipated. There has been movement in the situation around Twadell Avenue. We've experienced three relatively peaceful summers. We have the best working example of how to police a divided community. Urban renewal is evident, not least in this splendid building within which we are located this evening. Northern Ireland is, after all, officially, according to the Office of National Statistics Regional Poll, the happiest place to live in all of the United Kingdom. We have every reason to be optimistic. But what of hope? According to Moltmann, hope comes from outside, from God. Those of you who are uh, familiar with Presbyterianism will be aware that the symbol of the Reformed Church is the burning bush. The Huguenots, who were French Calvinists, first adopted the symbol in 1583. In Exodus 3, the exiled Moses is at an all-time low. He is literally at the backside of the desert. And he comes to Horeb, the mountain of God. 
There he encounters something or someone that changes his entire life. From within a bush that was burning yet not consumed, he encounters the almighty numinous one who commissions him to do the impossible, to confront the mighty Pharaoh and lead the beleaguered enslaved children of Israel out of slavery and into the promised land. This was not optimism. This was hope that comes from outside, from the divine. It is a picture of astonishing beauty and power, a flourishing bush burning yet alive, pointing forward to the vibrant and flourishing people released from the shackles of the past and liberated for the freedom of a future in the promised land. An increasing number of people in society believe that such liberation will only come if we abandon or privatise ideas of the divine and the supernatural. But does this view of the world leave room for secular hope? Anything authoritative about what it means for human beings to flourish? In his classic book, City of God, Augustine contends that a flourishing life consists of love of God and neighbour and enjoyment of both. A completely harmonious fellowship in the enjoyment of God and each other in God. It's a key claim of the Judeo-Christian tradition that to flourish we must live in relation to the creator and sustainer as this is what gives meaning and orientation to our endeavours. Augustine's vision of human flourishing is grounded in this story, which permits us to look outside and beyond ourselves to the one in whose image we are made. From this, we can say with conviction that human dignity and the importance of right relationships are not subjective human constructs, but are objectively grounded in the true nature of the divine. Secular humanism is gaining pervasive power in Ireland as it has in other societies and some of its values will be shared by Christians. But as a friend of mine, paraphrasing Nietzsche, has observed, and here is the warning, how long until exclusion of God leads to the exclusion of God words as well? Words such as love, sympathy, kindness, justice or compassion. If human beings become the centre of all focus, excluding the divine, then don't be surprised if the concepts we admire most dissipate as well. There are many laudable objectives in the Programme for Government framework and many excellent goals in the Belfast Agenda, the City Council's Community Plan, which most of us will concur However, people of faith will want to say that an agenda which eschews the idea of lives centred on God is not sufficient on its own to adequately shape a society where vulnerable people are victimised, suicide is endemic, drugs are peddled, alcohol abuse is tolerated and domestic, domestic sexual and racial violence is prevalent. It's often contended, of course, that religion is on the decline and secularism is on the up, and that is evident, not least here in North Belfast, in waning church attendance across denominations, closure of once prosperous and prestigious religious buildings, and the rise of Sunday trading. But this is only part of the picture. As, theologic, as uh, Timothy Keller, a uh, theological practitioner in New York, uh, that most secular of cities, has pointed out, the world is in fact becoming both more secular and more religious at one and the same time. Far from there being a decline in religion, worldwide the Christian church along with other world religions is expanding. Secularism and religion are both growing but along increasingly separate parallel lines. A major challenge for those of us who are part of the community of faith is how to engage respectfully with those who are sceptical and demonstrate that a concern for justice in society is grounded in the nature of God rather than in their own subjective feelings. 
Over the next few minutes then, I'd like to pick up on three of Augustine's convictions as quoted in uh, Miroslav Volf's book, A Public Faith, in order to offer an alternative narrow narrative to the prevailing contemporary secular commentary which seeks to push God out of any discussion. First of all, he contends that God is not an impersonal force in the world, but a person who loves and can be loved in return. Secondly, Augustine suggests that to be human is to love. We can choose what to love, but not whether to love. Thirdly, human beings will flourish and be truly happy when they discover joy in loving the infinite God and our neighbours in God. So the first of these God is not an impersonal force or influence in the world, but a person who loves and can be loved in return. In Exodus 3, Moses was not looking for anything when God broke into his consciousness and said, Moses, who are you? stuttered the shepherd. I am who I am, came the reply. Today, people are defined largely by what they do. What do you do is often the first question we ask a stranger. But the personal God, as revealed in the scriptures, is far less concerned about what we do than who we are. We are, after all, human beings, not human doings. The ultimate revelation of God, Christians believe, is through Jesus Christ. John's Gospel reveals him not once but seven times as the perfect I am. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the gate. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth and the life. I am the true vine. Since God is personal and relational, He has made human beings in his likeness as personalities with the capacity to love and be loved, not because of what we can do for him, but because of who we are in relation to him. Yes, we have been created to work, which is honourable and holy. But Christian flourishing consists not merely in doing things, striving hard and achieving more. Flourishing consists of being people who love and demonstrate compassion because that's what we were created for. Is it really a surprise that hospitals such as the Matter here in North Belfast or the hospice movement were founded by people of faith? Women and men motivated not by an impersonal force but by a person who loves and can be loved in return. People stimulated to uh, to care altruistically for people, not for anything that they can do for them in return, but quite simply because of who they are as human beings. This city is peppered with people of hope who unobtrusively pour their lives into caring for relatives, friends and strangers. I visited them in nursing homes, drug rehabilitation centres and post-prison residential units only recently. This week I have witnessed firsthand how the bike repair workshop run by members of Fort William and McCrory Presbyterian Church's social outreach programme has been a means of enabling young men from Nationalist New Lodge and Loyalist Tigers Bay to rub shoulders together and flourishing, flourish within a safe shared space. I've talked face to face with one of the resettled families from war-torn Syria. The same project has contributed to their lads' gainful employment, granting opportunities to integrate into the community and inculcate hope. God is not an impersonal force or influence, but a person who loves and can be loved in return. And the second contention is that to be human is to love. We can choose what to love, but not whether to love. Some people love naked bodies. 
Others love naked power or naked wealth. But quoting Emerson, C.S. Lewis, Belfast's own son, said, Do you love me means do you see, see the same truth, or at least do you care about the same truth? When Moses was captured by the beauty and majesty of the I am who I am, his entire personality was laid bare. This is what it was for him to be energised and motivated by a vision, to be compelled to action by hope from outside. The journey of faith that started at the fire would lead him and others with him from a desert place to a land flowing with milk and honey. It was a vision of a healthy environment, creativity and purpose in meaningful employment and respect for the law. But it was more. It was a revelation of a life of freedom, fulfilment and flourishing. The story of Exodus is not a story of unalloyed glory. The Bible will not let us believe that. Its text is a warts and all account of disappointment, backsliding and failure. Secularists have to understand that people of faith are not perfect, merely forgiven. And believers have to recognise that those with no religious preference share common grace. Forgiveness flounders, says Miroslav Wolf, because I exclude the enemy from the community of humans and myself from the community of sinners. But the story of Exodus is also a narrative of patience, restoration and hope motivated by an encounter with the one who is perfect. At our June General Assembly, reflecting upon the failure to find a consensus on dealing with the past in the Fresh Start Agreement, the Presbyterian Church in Ireland embarked on an 18th 18-month project to uncover a wider story about our responses to the Troubles, to recognise what was good and to identify and reflect upon the times when the Church failed to be faithful peacemakers. Every society has its idols that obscure the glory of God and the children of Israel likewise had their own golden calf which needed to be named and shattered and the Christian church is no different. But through our Vision for Society statement, which acknowledges past failures to live counter-cultural lives, yet also affirms that Christian peace building is seminal to Christian discipleship, we determine to live in a way that points to Jesus, who loved God perfectly, and perfectly loved people made in his image, and challenges us to face our own and contemporary society's modern idolatry and self-centeredness. To be human is to love. We can choose what to love, but not whether to love. And thirdly and finally, human beings will flourish and be truly happy when we discover joy in loving the infinite God and our neighbours in God. I started off by referring to the bush where the unsuspecting Moses encountered the divine and his priorities were wholly transformed. Here in North Belfast we also have many fires. Dotted over the city at certain times of the year in both communities are bonfires which give off the toxic fumes of heat rather than light. Given our history and fortress mindsets, while celebrating and commemorating the past, uh, they are also a danger to the environment, property and human well-being. They're not bonfires fuelled by inclusiveness, respect and healing, but a means by which we pass on to succeeding generations the sins of the fathers. Human flourishing and true happiness is when, like Moses, the heart is captured by an affection beyond self to loving God and our neighbours more than anything else. Is it too much to hope that at least as much effort might go into creating an environment of inclusivity, inclusivity about bonfires as to, say, cake making? 
here in this great city we have alternative examples of light in the darkness. In some places it's only small, it's only a flickering glow needing the wind of the Spirit to fan it fully into life. Fragile examples of hope, such as I've seen in Carn Money's new worshipping community at the MAC within the Cathedral Quarter, storehouses and trestle trusses ministry fighting food poverty in and through the provision of basic essentials of life, Wave Trauma Centre giving grassroots cross-community support to those who have experienced bereavement and injury through civil unrest, and the Nightlight Service that provides practical and practical support to young people lost, sad and vulnerable. These and a myriad of other ventures are shining stars in the night sky. In my own congregation, located at the edge of working and middle class suburbia, its members, compelled by their experience of having been loved by God, sought to identify a need they could best meet in Jesus' name, which no one else could or would do. They set up a Saturday afternoon youth club for boys and girls with severe learning difficulties. Run by ordinary, loving, compassionate volunteers, it soon became widely known as a place of care and support of children and their parents, worn out and hassled. One Christmas, some ladies from our church's community lunch club had an idea. We can't go down on our knees and play with the children or manage a heavy wheelchair, but we can cook. And so they prepared and served a Christmas lunch. And while the regular volunteers looked after the kids, the mams and dads were down in another place, sat down in another place, and ate a four-course dinner with all the trimmings. I couldn't help but notice tears dripping down the cheeks of one of the fathers. He apologised to me and explained, It's just that it's been 13 years since my wife and I have sat down to eat together like this. Thirteen years since you sat down to enjoy your Christmas dinner today, I replied. Uh, no, he replied. Thirteen years since we sat down to eat together. Human beings flourish and are truly happy when we discover joy in loving the infinite God and our neighbours in God. Andy Crouch of Christianity Today has observed that the Christian church is losing its temporal influence, influence, influencing government, policy and power. This may indeed be the reality in our increasing secular, postmodern, post-truth world. But it's imperative that the church must not become bashful about giving voice to the pressing social and moral and public issues which affect many people both within and outside the community of faith. It's often forgotten or overlooked that churches together contribute massively to the social well-being of society, often plugging gaps in areas of real human need. Research by Jubilee Plus estimated that in financial terms alone the contribution of church in the UK to the well-being of the community was worth 2.5 billion per year. The church's temporal influence may not be what it once was, but in the service of the Lord Jesus Christ, the challenge is to do what we were always meant to be, to be people of flourishing generosity, vulnerability and community. To be those who pray and point people beyond themselves to the divine. To be those who care for the vulnerable while recognising that we too are vulnerable. And be those who acknowledge that the common good is not only pursued individually but collectively and corporately. At the start of this lecture I referred to Walter Benjamin's famous description of Cleese painting Angelus Novus. Sadly, Benjamin's despair became utterly overwhelming and in September 1940 he took his own life during an attempt to flee from the Nazi regime. There is a third way between this despondency and naive optimism 
It is the way of hope. To clasp the hands of prayer, uh, said Carbart, is the beginning of an uprising against the disorder of this world. Christians believe that this anticipation, this confidence is found with found in an encounter with the invisible made visible, what C.S. Lewis described as joy, an unsatisfied desire which is itself more desirable than any other satisfaction. As human beings discover themselves through being loved and in turn loving the infinite God and neighbours in God, people enter into the unchartered and unpredictable journey from the backside of the streets of our city into the wide open spaces of forgiveness, compassion and fresh possibility. They burn with zeal and yet remain fully alive. They are aflame with joy and are not consumed by despair. This, ladies and gentlemen, is a vision of inexpressible hope sparked from an encounter on holy ground. Thank you.